Welcome to Transparency with Zeb King. Today we have Andrew Gage on our show. Welcome, Andrew. Thanks. Andrew is a, a lawyer and executive director, correct? No. No, not, not executive Staff director. Lawyer. Staff, staff lawyer. counsel, actually, I guess. The staff counselor with West Coast Environmental with Law. With West Coast Environmental Law, okay. What is West Coast Environmental Law? We're one of Canada's oldest public interest environmental law organizations. And so for over 40 years, we've been helping British Columbians who have problems, environmental problems that need legal, need legal advice with that, as well as working with the environmental community to advocate for stronger environmental laws. So do you yourself uh, uh, work uh, uh, on behalf of people as a lawyer going before? Uh, not typically no. before, actually to court. We, right. I, I, we, we will, and I've, a lot of times we'll be an, the one answering the phone and just giving some initial advice, suggesting who they can talk to in government, maybe writing a letter on their behalf. Um, but if it really is going to involve court uh, work beyond that, we generally would refer them to uh, lawyers in the private bar and maybe help them get, uh, get funding to hire those lawyers. And so most recently, we've, we've uh, both uh, had an interaction at the Central Saanich Council, where I'm a municipal councillor. Mm -hmm. You came and did a presentation, I think it was May 15th, uh, on what are uh, climate accountability letters right. and, and some action that you've researched and, and are hoping that uh, we'll, we'll, municipalities will take forward. Could you explain what those are? What these Sure, yeah. Um, I mean... I think many of us are very concerned about climate change. The impacts are already being felt in, here in BC, whether it's flooding, wild, wildfires, the mountain pine beetle, and this is the case around the world. More and more we're feeling these impacts, um, and yet the assumption has always been that those costs will be borne by us individually or by taxpayers. Um, and as those costs rise and rise, and as municipalities, as the province starts uh, incurring tens of millions, hundreds of millions, eventually billions of dollars of costs, uh, both preparing for climate change and rebuilding after floods, after wildfires, um, we, that, that's not sustainable. And, and it, we need to have a new conversation about who is uh, the role that we all play in climate, climate change and who it's fair to expect to pay these, these costs. And the fact is that the fossil fuel industry has known for decades that their products cause har harm, they're going to be causing these impacts. They make hundreds of billions of dollars in the profit, uh, profits in the process. And they've always assumed that they will never have to pay their fair share. And as long as that's the assumption, as long as we're assuming the taxpayers and not the industry that's making money from selling fossil fuels will have to uh, pay, then uh, there's no incentive for, for those companies to, to change their business model. There's no, it really, it's a barrier to, to solving climate change globally when there's this huge elephant in the room of this really lucrative industry that's not paying its fair share. It's not, not essentially taking responsibility for the harm caused by its products. Um, so we want to start that conversation and one of the ways we're, we're looking to do that is by asking communities to have a conversation about how is climate change affecting us now, how is it going to affect us in the future, and then asking, demanding really, that the, that the fossil fuel industry pay its, pay its fair share. We're not saying the fossil fuel industry is only to blame, that, you know, that we're not all part of this, mm -hmm. but right now you know, we as taxpayers are going to be paying these costs and this industry is assuming that they can continue exploiting uh, their reserves and, and marketing fossil fuels without ever paying the, 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 uh, a, a share of the costs. Uh, yeah. uh, so what the climate accountability letters are is just a simple letter that we're asking local governments and other levels of government to send saying here's the impacts that we are um, uh, expecting to suffer. Uh, will you Chevron, will you Exxon, Will you, uh, BP, pay your fair share uh, of those costs? We're going to expect you to do that. What do you think your fair share is? Opening that conversation, because until now we haven't really had that conversation. And so we were asking, we were asking local governments in particular to, to send uh, a letter to the 20 largest fossil fuel companies. There's 20 companies that collectively are responsible for almost 30% of the human cost greenhouse gas emissions in the global atmosphere today. Because I'm sure many viewers would say, well, hey, hey municipalities are using vehicles. They're, yeah. they're, yeah, exactly. They're just selling a product. Uh, and so municipalities are culpable too. How can they uh, right. suggest shifting it to the fossil fuel companies? But if I understand correctly, what, what you're saying is it's not 100% the fossil fuel companies, but there is a certain share that, uh, of responsibility. Absolutely. I mean, absolutely. I mean, clearly, this is a societal problem. Mm -hmm. We all use fossil fuels. Mm -hmm. See it, and I, you know, I mean, one of the reasons people are reluctant to even talk about this is because we, we feel some guilt, I think, about uh, the fact that 
maybe not directly guilt, but we don't want to admit to ourselves that our lifestyles yeah. raise these types of questions. Um, and, and I think the environmental community and government ha and, and industry, everyone, has, has sort of, uh, to a large degree, actually reinforced that sense that, oh, it's individual responsibility. If we just turned off the lights more, uh, if we just you know, drove more uh, energy-efficient vehicles, uh, you know, this problem could all be solved. No. I mean, right. you've got this situation where, where all of the, the cards are stacked, or, or, or all of the, you know, are, are all of the cards are, are um, in one industry's hands, yep. uh, and, and individuals have very few, few choices, uh, sure. and yet are being made to feel very responsible uh, for the And there's harm. a deliberate... And they don't have a lot of choice there. I mean, you know, whereas the industry has choice. I mean, BP showed that they actually could have done it. Uh, uh, they could have picked a very different path. They, they were all set to do that, and then they didn't. Um, and Shell also has often signaled that they that they you know are interested in investing in renewable energy, but the, when you look at what they actually invest, it's such a small fraction of what they actually um, invest in oil and gas development. So you know who really has the ability to change here and, and to to move us down a different path? It's not the individuals. I thought is is it fair to say that the cost of fossil fuels is. Um, Far lower than it should be in terms of it, yeah, and not only that, but the co the costs relative to renewables. I mean, renewable yeah. energy, uh, if if you had to reflect the true costs or even a fraction of the true costs of fossil fuels in um, uh, in their actual co cost, renewable energy we would hands, win hands down. I mean, you know, we would be transitioning off fo fossil fuels when very, you factor very in risks and and all of this that we're talking about in addition. Uh, yeah. The, what I mean, is already, externalized. Already there are, there are contexts where renewable energy is already competing very favorably with, um, with fossil fuels, but, but it's still a very uneven playing field. Well, well and uh, is playing it because... Where, where one industry doesn't have to take cradle-to-grave responsibility right. for their products. That's, that's the wording. Yeah, yeah. It's artificially low. Yeah, and it's a subsidy. If, if, we, if we say, well, the taxpayers will pay for the, the harm when it occurs, we know, we know the harm is going to occur, but the taxpayers will pick up the tab. That's a subsidy as well. That's another type of subsidy in addition to the subsidies on extracting uh, oil and gas uh, in the first place. So, but we have here an industry that that is not paying its fair share at all right now. Uh, you know, you and I are actually paying either um, through the carbon tax in BC, but also through the cost, our taxpayer dollars, as we rebuild communities that have been suffered from flooding or from wildfires, as we build higher seawalls or. Right. Um, uh, you know, drains that can withstand extreme f storm events. We actually are already beginning to pay, and we will pay more and more yes. as the as the impacts get higher. Taxpayers. And yeah. as long as you've got an industry that's saying, well, telling its shareholders, we can continue uh, exploiting our reserves, we can continue selling this product until the international community gets its act together and and reins in global uh, emissions. And there's no consequences to us. We, we we can promise that you will continue to profit. You will continue to benefit. That's a huge disincentive for them, or for that matter, governments that depend on the fossil fuel industry to do what they, what needs to be done. What scientists tell uh, us need to be done. And the fact is, this industry more than most of us has known um, since probably the 50s, uh, but certainly by the late 60s or early 70s, that their products were causing this harm. Uh, and not 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 only did they not take action to sort of move away into a more sustainable future. They actually really worked against that. They lobbied against action. They started funding denial uh, campaigns, clim climate climate misinformation campaigns. Um, they, you know, Exxon actually bought patents uh, in renewable energy technology and then sat on them so that no one else could develop them either. Um, you know, I mean, th this is mm -hmm. this is an industry that had it acted on what its scientists were telling it in the you know 50s or 60s could have helped us transform our society so that today we wouldn't be so dependent on fossil fuels. You and I, it's very difficult uh, you know, to, to if, we just, if we decide we don't want to use fossil fuel, fuels, I mean, the, really, the options aren't there. I mean, if you're wealthy enough, you can afford an electric vehicle, but most people can't. Mm -hmm. And even then, you're still, you know, there's still so many materials that, that yep. are made from oil and gas and that can't easily be substituted. Um, so these are companies that had the opportunity decades ago to actually uh, start reflecting the true cost of their products in their products and start, you know, moving towards renewable energy. And I mean, if you remember, BP actually tried to build a whole campaign around that. They said they were beyond petroleum and they were going to be the, the energy company of the future. And what happened to that? They, it became too, it was too lucrative not to continue down the road. They just dropped that. Uh, so, you know, we've got 
uh, it may well be true that we're all responsible for climate change, but the fact that some of us, some of us are more responsible than others, and those are the very companies that currently are not expecting to pay anything. Anything, and that's the key, right? Um, so with regards to the letter, it was to ask those companies in part to just to re reply with their fair share of the costs, right? To mm -hmm. indicate what their fair share would be. Right. What's the strategy in that? What's the uh, idea behind that? Uh, well, uh, we've been very clear this is the first step in a broader conversation. Uh, and until someone actually takes the step of saying, hang on, you can't just keep offloading this responsibility to our taxpayers. Um, there's no there's no opportunity for a conversation. Once you have that letter out there saying... Is know, that a standard legal uh, process? Well, I, I don't I, think I, we're... I don't, I don't think the client, I mean, certainly it is very common to to, uh, to send a demand letter before you initiate litigation, but that's not what these are. These no. letters are much uh, more general and just raising the question. Um, but that's important and, to clarify in case there was some fear from other members of council that... Well, this sounds like this is an initial step in terms of litigation. I don't know if that was there's a concern. No, there's no, certainly there's no obligation to like uh, move towards litigation just because you're asking a question. Uh, you know, that, that's, right. that's, that's clear. Uh, we are actually you know, interested in, in encouraging local governments to begin thinking about that possibility, the okay. possibility of litigation. And you know, we, we, uh, th this began when we sent a letter uh, signed on to by more than 55 community groups from across BC um, asking local governments to both send these letters but also to consider the possibility of a class action lawsuit, on, not by only one municipality, but on behalf of all of BC's municipalities coming together to hold these companies accountable. Uh, but, but even before we get there, the fact that if these letters get sent, then we're going to have the opportunity for shareholders to get up in the, the uh, meetings of these companies and say, you know, we understand you've received these letters. What is your response? Why haven't you answered the, the, the questions of these municipalities? Is there a cost here that's not being reflected in, in your right. disclosure to us? So it, it just raises a whole conversation that the companies desperately want to avoid because they can't appear as profitable as they appear if the true costs of their products are, are, being, uh, are, are being pointed out. And, and you know, in many ways, the emperor has no clothes here. Mm -hmm. Well, and there was pushback when the motion was made, and there was concern, I recall. There was some silence at the table, but there was mm -hmm. one member of council in particular, uh, Councillor Graham, who was mentioning him, how he felt it, it doesn't necessarily do much to send letters, and there was a bit, he was uncomfortable with the advocacy involved. Um, and there was a bit of back and forth uh, as to trying to make the point, uh, I was trying to make the point there that... Uh, that uh, taxpayers will end up paying, uh, and uh, and so we have a responsibility as a municipality to defend the taxpayers and yeah. and future generations, of course. But uh, in the end, that didn't win the day. However, I understand that you have had success uh, in Highlands. Yeah, on June fifth, the um, wonderful council at Highlands unanimously passed a motion saying wonderful. that they would be sending these letters uh, to the twenty companies and. Uh, yeah, we'll be, it'll be interesting to see what response we get from the, uh, if any, from the from the, the fossil fuel companies. You may not. Is that we may not. Uh, I mean, I think that it's quite possible that some may respond and others uh, will not. Um, uh, you know, but yeah, we'll have to wait and see. And if we don't, then we'll have to be following up with groups that hold shares in those companies, asking them whether they can get a response. Um, and we'll have to be, uh, you know, publicly calling them out on the fact that they don't have the courage to actually confront this question. And congratulations to Highlands Council for, for leading the Thanks way. The first, what, yeah. what, small municipality, probably the smallest in the CRD, uh, but, uh, but leading the pack. Uh, I, I, are there other municipalities that are considering it? There are others that are considering it, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know, hopefully by the time this airs, maybe we'll have some, some others have, who have sent them. I mean, one of the things that, mm -hmm. that you know, is interesting in terms of the risk of these companies is that this type of litigation could be brought in Bangladesh as easily as here. I mean, well, why isn't um, it? I think I think you know, there's been so much emphasis on let's get the emissions down, let's uh, let's avoid mm. dangerous climate change, mm. and 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 the, the the belief was that that we could actually tackle climate change and, and get it under control through international agreements without actually That's dealing with this shame. elephant in the room of like you know the the huge profits being made well, because we've we've tried that approach arguably. We've spent years doing it, and yeah. you could make a case, I think, that we've wasted years. Right, well, I mean, a global, like half of the greenhouse gas, human-caused greenhouse gas emissions in the atmosphere occurred since, historically, uh, occurred since 1992 when, when the world's nations came together and promised to avoid dangerous climate change. Is that right? It's, you know, we've actually increased our emissions wow. dramatically since we pledged to decrease them.
Well, I think taxpayers should be asking their councillors, if they're not going to send this type of letter, what are they doing right. to ensure that the full burden of uh, preparing for climate impacts don't fall to, to them as taxpayers? And I mean, it, you know, I think that the uh, capital region municipalities in some ways are less vulnerable than, say, Delta or, or Richmond in, uh, oh. in, in the lower mainland, but I mean, just Metro due to Vancouver, the geography. just because just because we're further above sea level, Metro yeah. Vancouver. Uh, the province of BC estimates that Metro, Metro Vancouver municipalities are going to need to spend $9.5 billion between now and 2100 to deal with rising sea levels alone. That's about $100 million a year. I, I just can't imagine how that could be on the backs of, of property taxpayers. Well, that's right. I mean, I know some of it would, would I mean, if status quo, I'm sure there would be funding from the federal government and the province as well, as well but, but ultimately that's still taxpayer dollars. Mm -hmm. And a lot of it will cut, fall to the municipalities if they actually go forward and implement that. And if they don't, they're really opening themselves up to um, both catastrophic you know, loss if, if, they, if the flooding that the, 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 these uh, you know, higher sea walls and, and the like are intended to avoid, if that happens, and also liability for the municipalities because they know that work needs to be done. And if they don't do it, there's questions about whether or not they, uh, they, they've... Um, Acted responsibly. It's also for. So it, what do you mean in terms of building the well, higher dams? I mean, and I'm, 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 yeah, or, I mean, yeah. The, the, we have an example of a case um, that, that, um, in, in the U.S. a few years ago, where an insurance company actually sued several municipalities <laughs> for not um, uh, not preparing their their stormwater infrastructure, not, not their drains, uh, not 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 incorporating climate science into the building of their their drainage systems. Um, and then when there was flooding that occurred as a result, uh, the, the insurance company said, well, we're paying these insurance claims when uh, you, know, you should have known that climate change was going to cost these impacts. Oh. Well, they ultimately dropped that ca case and said that they had brought, brought it mostly to just make a point of what could be coming. But nonetheless, I mean, the, the point is that the fossil fuel companies actually played a very direct role in creating those risks, and they weren't involved in that lawsuit. It was the municipalities that were being targeted for not having done the work uh, and incurred the expenses. Uh, ahead of time. And when we say the municipalities again, we, we need to remember it's the property taxpayers or the taxpayers, the, the, the uh, ratepayers of the municipality that end up paying. Sometimes when we mention it's the municipalities, it sounds like a, it's the it's council something, yeah. or the government, but in fact it's the people in the community that we represent. Ultimately, yeah. yeah. And you, just recently, Prime, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau was, was talking about, after flooding, was talking about we're going to see more and more of this and it's going to be we've got to build when we rebuild our communities from flooding we have to rebuild them better um and it's going to he said it's going to be more costly to do that but no nowhere in that speech was like here's how we're going to pay for that, that. uh you know the assumption continues to be that it's taxpayers paying for that um and at some point we can no longer afford that mm -hmm. Yeah, well, the Insurance Bureau of, of Canada has been warning about the increase in, in uh, payouts due to uh, extreme weather for year, years now. Um, and the last several years have been the highest. Uh, I don't have the figures at my fingertips, but the, you know, it's been the highest payouts due to extreme weather, both by the insurance companies, but also by the Federal Disaster Relief Fund. Um, would, uh, would the insurance companies, do you think, ever consider uh, a lawsuit against the fossil fuel companies? Yeah, I mean, I think some of them probably have cons considered that, but uh, it's a difficult terrain for them because they also, the, the fossil fuel companies are major clients of, of theirs mm -hmm. in many cases. Um, uh, you know, they, they, they insure that, uh, them. Um, the, you know, so, so I'm, I'm, I'd be surprised if it hadn't been considered. There's some uh, insurance companies that have actually done a lot of thinking around you know, legal liability issues around um, uh, climate change. But um, so far, I haven't heard any suggestion that they would. I also think, as I said before, the political desire for this is very important. And, and uh, you know, insurance companies probably don't see that there's a political appetite currently. Um, and they're not necessarily well placed to, to raise these questions right. publicly in the same way that uh, you know, municipalities or community groups um, can do. How about the costs of a potential lawsuit? I mean, that might be daunting for some people to uh, think you, of. You mean if, a, if, yeah. if municipalities decided to wage a class yeah. action lawsuit? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's a huge question. Um, I, I think that the, the costs, I mean, that's one of the advantages to a class action where you bring the suit on behalf of a whole bunch of municipalities rather than you know, one municipality mm -hmm. uh, going, going to bat. Um, and, but, but nonetheless, there would have to be... Uh, 
uh, you know, some fairly innovative financing in terms of uh, looking for encouraging many municipalities to put in money, but encouraging uh, you know, angel investor type figures to help fund the, uh, the cost of the lawsuit uh, in terms of you know, maybe crowdfunding or, or uh, other means of supporting this, because it would be a fairly major lawsuit um, even well, for yeah. municipalities. It sounds a lot like the uh, tobacco question. Maybe. To what degree is it similar if yeah, there is a no, class think, action lawsuit? In the I, I think that the, the similarities really are in the, the way we perceive the, these, these industries. There was a time when Big Tobacco boasted, we've never settled a case, we've never lost a court case, and we never will. Uh, and really the public by and large supported them in that because they, they collectively we bought the argument that this was the smoker's fault. Uh, you know, it's not that this, this industry was just providing a, a product. Right. right. And, and that shift, when it came, was sudden, it was very dramatic, and, and really the, the public opinion on that shifted, not quite overnight, but pretty much. And, and I think that that's, that's the similarity, that, that, that at some point I expect we will see that shift in relation to the fossil fuel industry. And again, clearly smokers, you know, it's an addictive pro product, but nonetheless smokers have some choice in this, just as we have choice about whether you drive or not. But that doesn't mean that the company has no responsibility. It doesn't mean that they can suppress the science or that they can continue uh, marketing harmful versions of the, of the product. I actually think you can sue under uh, Canadian law for, for the, the role of the fossil fuel industry in causing climate uh, damages. But if there are challenges, and people, there are other people out there who say there are, that's a political question. We can change the law to make it easier to, to, to bring those types of lawsuits. And if the public demands that, the, you know, the government will respond. And the uh, fossil fuel companies have lawyers. Mm -hmm. What do you think they're doing? I mean, they're aware of this question, I would imagine. Mm -hmm. They're probably preparing. I personally think that the, the, the companies that have thought about this, and I think some of them have, uh, see the big risk. They, they, they've known that there's a legal risk for probably a decade. I mean, yeah. there, there were lawsuits brought in the U.S. that were basically about this type of theory. The Kivalina lawsuit was an Alaskan village suing um, uh, major fossil fuel companies and energy companies for their contribution to the cost of relocating that village due to climate change. Um, but I think that they've, they've, they haven't felt that there's a political risk backing up, that the public hasn't really been asking for that. And so even if they, they lost that case, it was probably not necessarily a huge, it would know, be costly, but it wouldn't necessarily translate into a cascade of other Cases. So I think that the risk to the companies is when people actually start asking, hang on, why is, this, why is my taxpayer dollar being used for this? Why, you know, why aren't you as government pursuing these companies? Uh, and the political risk is at least as significant as the legal risk. Um, and so it's interesting that, that uh, Chevron just recently, uh, for the first time, disclosed to their shareholders that there was a risk of litigation against them. Uh, that was about a month after we had publicly asked for the local governments to, to do that. Probably no connection there, but you know, who knows? Um, and uh, you know, I think more and more um, companies will start, or are going to have to start disclosing that they, they see a risk of litigation to their shareholders because that's more and more obvious. They have a responsibility. Um, they have a responsibility well to their shareholders, to which effect, affects you know how how um, uh, lucrative they, they appear to the, their investors. Um, you know, right now the companies are still really downplaying that risk in the in their their. I mean, Chevron's statement was like. And highly improbable or something like language to that effect, but they nonetheless mentioned it as something their shareholders should be aware of. One of the, one of the things in addressing climate change that we always have to grapple with is, uh, you know, can it, what can be done at a national level? What can be done in Canada? What can be done even at a local level? And, you know, Canada's global emissions are about 2% of emissions. And if we just focus on regulating what happens in Canada, that's, you know, it's important and it's, it's, it's symbolically hugely important. Um, uh, but, if we focus on the harm that's occurring in Canada, communities in Canada that are harmed can demand global responsibility from these companies uh, because of the harm occurred in Canada in Canadian courts, and that, that changes oh, the game. Interesting, in Canadian courts. Yeah, you could go to a Canadian court and say Chevron's global operations have caused this, this amount of harm in Exxon's, and, uh, and we're demanding accountability here in Canada because the harm occurred here in Canada. So what are the next steps now that you've sent out the letter to all municipalities, you've had some mm -hmm. municipalities say yes, some no, some are still thinking about it in terms of sending these letters to the fossil fuel companies. Uh, Highland's leading the way mm -hmm. on that. What happens next? Well, I think we want, uh, we want to invite you know, your viewers and, and other members right. of the public to, to um, broaden that conversation. I mean, it's, it, we want local governments to be doing it more and more because the people are demanding it. Mm -hmm. We want conversations about 
uh, you know, how our communities sure. will pay for these impacts and, and whether the, client, the fossil fuel companies So, So play do a people role. feel it's ultimately the taxpayer that should be footing yeah. it 100% or to some degree the fossil fuel companies right. shouldering some of the costs? And we want people to actually ask for that type of um, responsibility uh, from the companies. Ask their, their local governments, ask their provincial and uh, federal uh, representatives for those, that type of accountability. Um, and then we'll also be talking to groups that work with shareholders about raising these questions at shareholders' meetings. Uh, we'll be talking to media about the fact that communities are demanding these, these impacts. And as we get answers back from the, the, uh, the companies, or, or non-answers back from the companies, uh, you know, we will again be raising the question of, of whether or not uh, there is existing legal responsibility under Canadian law, whether they could be sued, whether they owe a duty, even if they're not sued, whether they owe a duty to, uh, um, to bear their fair share of the climate costs. And uh, we, we believe that this conversation is happening more and more around the world as well. Uh, you know, there already is a, a human rights complaint being brought against private fossil fuel companies in the Philippines. Um, where, you know, it's not about compensation so much there, but the Human Rights Commission of the Philippines is investigating whether these private companies have violated the rights of the, the human rights of the people of the Philippines by contributing to climate change. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a, a um, Peruvian farmer, Sol Luciano, who has sued a German coal company, RWE, in German courts uh, for the costs of preparing his community for climate change, or their fair share of it, uh, 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 which is actually, you know, very... Small, small share, but nonetheless, they want to establish that that is actually a duty that this company owes to his community in Peru. Mm -hmm. uh, so there are examples of this, and I think there'll be more and more examples as as time goes on. Can people go to the West Coast Environmental Laws website to find out more? Is there absolutely yeah, yeah. wcl.org, or also there's a, there's a website that's really focused on this campaign called climatelawinourhands.org. Okay. Uh, so it's got information about um, you know, what we asked. It's got the letter that we sent, for example, to the local governments. It's got some sample uh, climate accountability letters. It's got a spreadsheet of all of the different um, fossil fuel companies and their share, mm -hmm. their share of um, climate uh, of contribution to greenhouse gases and their mailing addresses. Well, Absolutely. I hope people will take that up. I know that the motion that Highlands uh, passed, I understand anyway, was to also send their motion to other municipalities, letting them know of the action they're taking and invite them to do something right. similar. So viewers uh, in other municipalities could could contribute by writing to their mayor and council and uh, expressing their interest. Yeah. Well, Andrew, I really want to thank you for the work you're doing and thank you for coming on our show. Thank you. Thank you.